Uh, before we get started, I just want to take a moment uh, to thank Microtick for putting on the MUM. If you've ever put on one of these kinds of events before, I can tell you it's a lot of work. And if everything goes smoothly, nobody notices. If something bad happened, everybody notices. So uh, maybe just a quick round of applause to thank them for uh, putting this event on for us. So is everybody enjoying themselves so far? Yeah, lots of good, good presentations. All right, my name is Steve Disher. And uh, I'm from College Station, Texas. Does anyone know where College Station is? No, I didn't think so. What about Texas? A few? Okay. All right. Well, uh, Texans speak English, but we have a little bit different English. We didn't think there were enough words in the English language, so we added some. So uh, if you th hear things like howdy, that means hello. Uh, yonder, that could be right there, or it could mean way over there. It just depends on the enunciation that we use. Uh, we also say things like y'all. Does anybody know what y'all means? Y-A apostrophe L-L. It's a contraction that we created to make our language faster. Uh, and it means you all or you guys or you collectively. So I'll try not to use howdy, y'all, or yonder so that you might be able to understand my presentation better. So I'm from the U.S. And uh, Texas, as you can see, is kind of uh, one of the most southern states. Uh, Texas was always the largest state until we admitted uh, Alaska into the United States, which made a lot of Texans angry because now we're not the biggest state anymore. We just act like we're the biggest state. And I live in College Station, which is about halfway between Houston and Dallas. So uh, it's, it's hot there and humid, and uh, it's actually a pretty good place for wireless because uh, we don't have mountains. A little bit about me. First of all, I operate a WISP. Um, been in business for about two years. Been doing wireless longer than that, but just uh, finally decided to get into the WISP market about two years ago. Um, today we have about 350 subscribers. We're adding about 20 subscribers a month. And uh, I have a, a daytime job as well to support my wireless habit. It takes, it's kind of like a drug habit. You have to have a lot of money to support it. Uh, and I do sales for a, a tier four data center in Bryan, Texas. We have about 17,000 feet of raised floor space and my responsibility is to keep that space full. Uh, one of the other things I do with my WISP activity is that uh, since I have access to a lot of bandwidth, I sell bandwidth to other WISP. Uh, the largest one that I sell bandwidth to has about 1,200 customers today. And I'm also a Microtech instructor and consultant, and uh, my little company is learnmicrotech.com. You can see us on the web. Uh, incidentally, our data center is fibertown.com. All right, so how many people in the room do we have that are doing uh, point to multi point wireless? Okay. Of those, how many of you are using 2.4 gigahertz? All right, how many are using 5.8? About the same number. What about 900 megahertz? Okay, well, no hands, that's good. We might actually have some new material for you today. Uh, as you know, if you're using wireless, conventional, unlicensed, 802.11, 2458, whatever the frequency, uh, typically requires line of sight between the client and the access point. There are, of course, some exceptions. On some very short hops, uh, you can get by with possibly a tree uh, or some other object between the two points. but. Uh, even though there are some exceptions for reliable links, we typically need a uh, dedicated line of sight. Uh, in many areas where I'm from, um, it takes at least a 50 or 60 foot structure to get the client antenna up high enough to clear the canopy, the tree canopy. Most of our trees in Texas, or at least uh, southeast Texas where I live, are oak trees. They average about 45 feet in height. And if you don't get over the oak trees, you don't get acceptable signal. So you're looking at a somewhere between a 40 and 50, maybe 60 foot structure to get over the tree canopy. So that gives us some options to get over the canopy. First of all is a telescoping mast. Does anyone, everyone know what I'm talking about with a telescoping mast? 
I see a lot of heads, okay. Uh, I see a lot of frowns, too, because you've got experience putting up telescoping masts. They are a royal pain in the rear end. Uh, there are a lot of work to put up, a lot of work to maintain, and uh, incidentally, they can become very expensive because of the labor that's required, and they're also kind of ugly. Uh, another option is bracketed towers. Uh, I'm talking about like a Rhone tower. We have a lot of Rhone towers in the U.S. Uh, bracketed off to some substantial structure, whether it be a house or a barn. Another option is a guide tower. Uh, again, a tower with a foundation and guy wires that hold it erect uh, and in position. And then the last option would be a, well, not the last, but the next to the last option would be a freestanding tower. And then finally, uh, some available structure, maybe a silo, uh, a very tall house, uh, a steeple on a church, some other tall structure. Now, one thing Texans are, and that is very industrious about where we mount our antennas. Now, this is not my antenna I'm gonna show you, it's one of my competitors, but they thought the top of a tree would be a great place to mount an antenna. It's not a very good picture. I took it with my iPhone going home one evening, but you can see in the yellow arrow, they've got a piece of pipe bolted to a branch and a, a 2-4 grid on top. So, you know, it's not too bad. We do what we have to do, right? Um, first of all, talking about the different types of towers. Uh, telescoping mass, they can be very expensive and labor intensive. If you've ever put one up, it's not easy, especially a 50-footer. When you get done, it looks kind of uh, about like that, usually, kind of a banana shape. It's really hard to get them straight. And then you have the added problem of the maintenance. Uh, if you have a windstorm, uh, any kind of a weather event, you're gonna have some that get knocked down or at least guy wires break. They're unsightly. They're expensive to maintain. And they may be prohibited by homeowners associations. Uh, I don't know about your other countries that all of you are from, but uh, especially in the U.S. and Texas, uh, most certainly, homeowners associations are very powerful. Uh, they have the ability, if you don't uh, abide with their covenants by keeping your grass mowed and you know 2.5 trees in your yard, uh, they have the ability to basically sue you and take your house from you if you don't abide by their covenant. So they're very powerful, especially in Texas. Uh, and most of them do not allow uh, towers or wireless gear mounted where it can be seen on the outside of the house. So that presents a real challenge for, for the WISP. And then finally, the incremental cost that's involved with telescoping mast. Uh, anytime a customer has a problem with a radio, you've got to send a crew of at least two guys out there, lower that thing all the way down, replace the radio, put it back up, and repoint it. So there's an incremental cost, and typically customers don't want to pay a service fee for you to come out and service that mast. They think it's a cost that you ought to bear. So the average cost in the U.S. for a 50-foot telescoping mast uh, averages about $300 to erect one. That includes the materials as well as the labor that's involved. So next I want to talk about bracketed guide or freestanding towers. Uh, just like telescoping masts, they're expensive and they're labor-intensive to install. They can also be unsightly. And we get a lot of comments from homeowners that are concerned that somehow this tower or this mast is gonna attract lightning to their house. Okay, so that concerns people, especially country people that are most of the ones that I serve. And again, they may be prohibited by the homeowners association. And the average cost for a 50-foot Rhone tower installed in the US is about $1,500. So I want to propose to you today a solution. I've spent quite a bit of our time already talking about problem definition. Now I want to talk about one solution that we've found. Uh, and that is non-line of sight equipment operating in the 900 megahertz spectrum. Uh, 900 megahertz as unlicensed frequency uh, has been around for a while. I think some of the original Waveland cards uh, used 900. Uh, but it really didn't gain popularity until uh, Ubiquity came out with their XR, or I think at the time it was the SR9 card, and now they have the XR9. Uh, those cards are fully supported by Microtik, and uh, 
Together, they make a, a really decent non-line of sight platform at a low price point. As you may know, lower frequencies have the ability to cut through uh, some amount of foliage um, that will allow you to mount the device below the tree canopy and not have to put up a mast or a tower at the customer location. Well, with this new solution, there, there comes some trade-offs uh, as well as some advantages. Uh, one advantage that we mentioned is the 900 penetrates the foliage better than 2, 4, or 5, 8. So that's one advantage. Now, 900 will not penetrate hills or mountains, okay? When it first came out, we were told that we'd be able to shoot through, uh, you know, Stone Mountain and uh, get signal, and uh, that has not been my particular experience. If someone is doing that, um, I'd like to hire them to come to work for me because I would certainly have a lot more customers. They will not penetrate miles and miles of foliage. Okay, you can't shoot through the uh, Sam Houston National Forest in Texas and expect to get signal out the other side. It's just not going to happen. And 900 brings about all new sources of interference that we never thought were before possible. And I have a little saying, and, and I wish this was original, but I robbed it from a friend of mine, and it is, most problems are the result of a previous solution. So if you're in IT, you've seen that before, okay? Customer needs a new solution, you go put out the solution for them, the next day they're calling you and say, well, that works great, but now my blah doesn't work anymore, okay? So with the 900, we have new solutions, but we also induce new problems. So a quick review about what I call uh, legacy Wi-Fi, and that is things operating in the 2.4 spectrum, for instance. 2.4 experiences uh, interference from cordless phones, wireless home routers that just about everyone has now, and we've even had instances where we have 2.4 uh, CPEs at customer locations, and they have a 2.4 router, and now their router on channel 6 is interfering with their CPE. Baby monitors. There's uh, some 2.4 gigahertz baby monitors sold in the U.S., other ISPs, that's probably my largest source of interference, is other ISPs that have been in business for a while who have a lot of 2-4 customers out there. So with this new solution comes some new challenges. First of all, 900 uh, also suffers from interference from cordless phones, baby monitors, other ISP, especially those running Motorola Canopy. Motorola Canopy 900 uses most of the spectrum. And uh, if anyone's running Canopy near you, you're going to have interference problems. Another form of interference is SCADA. SCADA stands for Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition Systems. They're used by utility companies in the U.S., oil field service companies in our area, a lot of people running SCADA over 900 on the same unlicensed frequencies that we're allowed to use. Uh, also, paging companies. So what we have to do is to adapt to this new solution. Uh, mistake number one, and I hear this from anyone that tries 900, and, and I'm guilty of it myself, uh, we thought that we could simply add a 900 access point next to our existing 2.4 and 5.8 APs on our 300-foot towers and serve all the customers that we couldn't serve before. Okay, it's not true. You can't do that. And there's some good reasons for that. The 900 carries a long ways, so when you put a 900 access point on 300-foot tower, you're going to pick up miles and miles and miles of interference. Uh, we tried it. We even tried horizontal polarity, hoping we'd knock out some of that, uh, some of that uh, competition for spectrum, uh, and it still didn't work. If we got five, 600K throughput to one client, that was pretty good. So that is not a solution. If you thought you had interference issues with 2.4, wait till you try 900. So adapting to the new solution. First of all, what we recommend is mitigating interference from external sources, and I'm gonna show you how we do that and uh, have done it very effectively. Secondly, mitigating interference from internal sources. And what I mean by internal is your own network. As you start putting up these 900 megahertz towers, uh, pretty soon you're interfering with yourself. So you've got all the external sources of interference that you can't control. You have the internal sources that 
are your own, and those are the only ones you can really control. Uh, this is an old cartoon. Uh, it's Pogo is the name of the cartoon, and Pogo says, we have met the enemy, and he is us. So sometimes we can be our own worst enemy, especially with the 900. Third thing is maintain low cost of entry for customers. Uh, if we double, triple, or quadruple the cost of turning up customers, it's not really a benefit to using the 900. And it also allows us to operate in areas where homeowners restrictions may uh, prohibit the use of towers or masts. So specifically, what I want to talk about is what I call neighborhood sales. Neighborhood sales utilize conventional or existing tower infrastructure, uh, unlicensed or licensed links to, to backhaul bandwidth into neighborhoods. So the concept is to use your existing wireless infrastructure uh, as a backhaul. So using sector antennas or APs that uh, have multi-point uh, clients on them and then using that as a backhaul or a repeater to get the signal into a neighborhood and then redistributing that signal using the 900 on a much smaller cell. We use the uh, non-line of sight frequencies for our access layer within the neighborhood. In this particular design, I'm going to be describing uh, tracks the three-layer hierarchical model. That is a network model with a core layer, a distribution layer, and an access layer. The benefit of using our existing Wi-Fi infrastructure uh, as your distribution layer means that you don't have to build new backhauls to support these new neighborhood cells. You can use your existing infrastructure. And then the low cost infrastructure I'm going to describe you, to you today then becomes the access layer for the customers. So here's what I'm talking about. Uh, everything from the center of this diagram over is your existing infrastructure. You have some connection to the internet, some kind of core or gateway routing infrastructure, uh, some existing tower, in this case uh, five gigahertz that we're using uh, for customer connections to that AP. Uh, but now we bring into the picture this neighborhood cell. We use our existing point-to-multi-point uh, -point access point to backhaul our bandwidth in and then redistribute it using 900 within the, the smaller neighborhood. Pretty simplistic concept, uh, but the proper execution, um, according to the lessons we've learned, may be the key to your success in getting it right the first time. So let's talk about the equipment itself because that's why we're all here, is to talk about Microtik. Uh, the distribution layer is your existing point-to-multi-point Wi-Fi gear. Typically 5.8 is what we use, uh, 5.3, 5.8, because of the higher throughputs that are available. And also the additional channels. Uh, our network is all Microtik. We don't use any other product. Uh, primarily because they're reliable, but also because we run the in-stream protocol for all our point-to-multi-point. Uh, in-stream has a lot of benefits, uh, and it also restricts you to only using the Microsoft product because it is a proprietary protocol. But uh, we believe that that uh, restriction is well worth the benefit that we get. We operate all of our access points typically on water towers because we have contracts with the local water company. Uh, it's a very good platform, a good place to work. We have a good working relationship with them. And then we use uh, five gigahertz, either license, uh, unlicensed or we have a few license links uh, to backhaul to our data center where we get our connection to the internet. And that's our distribution layer. Next, the access layer. Uh, missing the uh, letter N. I finished my presentation after a couple of beers last night and I don't think I spell checked very well. Uh, but the access layer is specifically the neighborhood tower and the CPE. We use the Ubiquity 900 card with the Microtik as the AP. We use a 900 megahertz Omni antenna. Before you start groaning about, oh, Omnis, Omnis are bad. Omnis are bad uh, with 2, 4, and 5, 8 when you try and use them in a large area, but they're very effective in a neighborhood cell where you can shield them from external sources of interference. We use an integrated panel antenna with the Ubiquity 900 card and the Microtik 411 as our CPE. 
And finally, that's what I've already showed you, but that's what the infrastructure looks like. Specifically, the combinations for the tower are router board 433 with an XR9 card, and we use the Comet 9.2 dB Omni. And I will be putting this presentation up on the wiki, so if you want to uh, look at some of this equipment there, you can feel free to do so. Uh, for our backhaul, we use the same 433 board. We only use one board on these neighborhood cells. We don't need two boards. One is plenty powerful. Uh, we put two cards in the board. We have been use either an XR5 or uh, R52 uh, as our, our backhaul radio, and then we use the XR9 in the same uh, router board as our, our, our local 900 radio. Um, Currently, we're using the Arc Wireless 23 dB panel antenna, which has an integrated enclosure on the rear of the antenna. They work very well for these backhaul applications. And then at the customer location, we're currently using the Arc Wireless 12.5 dB integrated antenna. Uh, again, the XR9 card and the router board 411. So let's talk about the tower itself, where we're actually going to mount this gear. The most cost-effective thing you can do is find somebody who may be in the neighborhood who has an existing television tower. Uh, don't particularly want to use a 50-foot mast, but if they have a roan or a self-supporting tower of some kind, uh, it makes a great place to, to put your gear. It has the lowest cost of entry, you can typically trade space on the tower for internet service to that particular customer. And we do that quite a bit. We, I don't think, have ever paid a customer for use of their tower. We just swap internet service to them. Gives you the fastest rate of deployment. And you may find subdivisions or uh, neighborhood areas where these structures have been grandfathered in. Uh, Grandfathering is a term that means uh, the structure was already there, the subdivision was built later, and so the people don't have to take it down and they don't have to comply with that particular homeowner's restriction. Another uh, opportunity that we've taken advantage of is an area where there's not an existing structure to locate our gear, and we've built a small self-supporting tower there. Uh, you can purchase in the U.S. a 70-foot uh, self-supporting tower for about $800. They're not terribly difficult to erect, uh, and we can usually uh, swap a ground lease space to the landowner for internet service. Uh, disadvantage, you do have a higher cost of entry. It takes longer to put this tower up than to utilize an existing tower. Uh, but you do have a better choice of location. Uh, you might be able to get a location that is exactly in the center of the area you're trying to serve, and that, that's a great location. So here's what uh, the final configuration looks like. Uh, router board 433 with a 5 gigahertz XR5 card or an R52 card, and that's your backhaul, and then a 900 megahertz with an Omni antenna. Here's a picture or an example of one of the installations that we've done. Uh, the yellow arrow uh, shows the Omni antenna, the 900 megahertz Omni. Uh, the green arrow shows the 5 gigahertz backhaul antenna. Now, one thing you're going to notice is the backhaul is actually a lot lower than the Omni. Uh, this house had no trees between the house and our tower. And so there was really no reason to climb any higher with that 5.8. Uh, so uh, in this particular scenario, we used a weatherproof enclosure, and I'll show you what our enclosures look like in a moment. And we ran uh, LMR down to the back hall and LMR coax up to the Omni antenna. So this is a situation where uh, the homeowner just allowed us to use their tower uh, as a trade for internet service. Here's another one. Uh, this one's a little bit different. Uh, at the top is the 5.8 backhaul. I'm not a very good photographer. If you can't figure that out, all my pictures are taken with my cell phone. Uh, someday I'll have a nice camera. Uh, and then the yellow arrow shows the Omni antenna, which is kind of on the back side, a little bit hard to see. And then that grid that does not have an arrow pointing to it is actually our competitor's antenna that they just haven't been out to pick up yet since we... Uh, had them cancel service with them. So, 
Here's what the inside of our typical uh, enclosure looks like. Uh, we, we take a lot of time in designing these and building them so that they come out neat and orderly. Uh, things last longer and are more reliable when you do them in a neat and a good craftsmanship-like manner. Uh, point out some of the things in this box. First of all, the enclosure itself is about 24 by 24 inches. Uh, it is a NEMA enclosure, meaning it's a rain-tight enclosure. It's not waterproof, uh, but it is rain-tight. Um, the big um, black box that says remote reboot is our standard uh, remote reboot device. That device is about $120 US. It's worth a million dollars to me if I don't have to go to a tower in the middle of the night and reboot it manually. Uh, it has the ability to control all eight of the outlets using a web browser interface, and it will also ping a remote host, and if that host does not reply, it will reboot uh, the devices that are connected to the outlets. So that's money well spent. Uh, also, you see on the left-hand side a standard UPS, and uh, right in the center is the POE. And then in this particular scenario, this is a neighborhood cell that we put in an industrial location. And uh, our primary customer, or the landowner, uh, was a business. And uh, part of the deal was that they asked that we put up a wireless bridge to one of their other buildings, and they supplied a uh, Cisco uh, bridge, and we installed it for them as part of the swap for letting us use their tower. So all of this is well and good, but if we don't plan on mitigating interference, we're still going to have problems. So what we do is we typically use the top of the tower to shoot over the canopy as our backhaul up around the 50 or 60 foot level. But then the, the trick, if you will, is to place the Omni at or just below treetop level. All right, uh, all of your customers are going to be shooting through foliage anyway. That's, that's what we're trying to, to be able to accomplish here. So by getting the Omni just below tree level, you're at the point in the trees where the foliage is the thinnest, but uh, you also get the effect of shielding that Omni from interference coming from outside the neighborhood. And this also provides the, the shortest length of the shot through the foliage. And I'll show you what I mean by that in a moment. So here's a diagram. On the left-hand side, uh, we see the, the CPE. And we typically can mount these on a chimney or a bracket on the roof of the house. Uh, and then the CPE is aimed at the tower and shooting through the tops of the trees. Uh, the rest of the trees in the area actually give you some shielding from interference that's coming into the area. So it has a, a double effect. Now, we're all in this to make money. That's, we're not just doing this because it's fun or we enjoy the, the exercise. So I want to talk about return on investment and the economics that are involved with using a neighborhood cell versus a typical tower infrastructure like we're used to using. First of all, uh, faster return on investment. Uh, conventional large-scale point-to-point or point-to-multi-point towers versus neighborhood cells, uh, the neighborhood cell is going to have a faster ROI. So let's describe that for a minute. Uh, the conventional distribution tower model typically employs at least three access points on 120-degree sectors to serve a 360-degree area. That's what most of us are, are typically used to doing. Depending on the technology, uh, the rates delivered to the customers and other factors, uh, we typically don't use more than 40 or 50 clients per access point. Now that's really a uh, in-stream uh, dictated number, uh, but 40 to 50 with the kind of bandwidth we supply is, is really a maximum, that's where we wanna be. So if you assume 50 clients per AP and three APs, that's 150 clients per tower. Each of those clients would require a line of sight, of course, because this is 2, 4, or 5, 8 gigahertz. And based on our experience, uh, between 35 and 60% of the site surveys that we do, we cannot serve. 
So somewhere between 35 and 60% of your customer base is not servable by a conventional approach. The capital investment for a uh, tower, assuming typical construction costs, a 200-foot tower with three 5 gigahertz APs, tower labor and materials is about 10,000 US. The sector antenna is about $600 total, 750 for radios, 900 for backhaul antenna and electronics. We've got some miscellaneous things. So a total capital investment for a conventional tower built from the ground up in a green field is about $12,850. That takes your average cost per client if you're 75% full, and typically we're not 100% full, to about $114 per client. Now that's not counting the CPE. Uh, our CPEs are typically covered by uh, the customer as an install charge. So our cost to serve 150 customers is about $114 per customer with a typical tower infrastructure. Best case scenario uh, for a neighborhood cell would be a customer with an existing TV tower. Uh, we always install an electrical outlet next to the tower. Uh, we had thoughts in the beginning about not spending the 200 or so dollars to install our own outlet. We became fearful that if we were to plug the thing in inside the house that grandmother, when she goes to vacuum the floor, would unplug our tower and take down 20 customers. So it's cheaper, in our opinion, to have an electrician install your own outlet there for your dedicated use. So that's about $200. AP backhaul radio, 350, 900 Omni, about 85. So a total capital investment for a neighborhood tower, $1,120. Now, we are typically serving around 15 to 20 clients per tower. So now we've gone from 100 and something dollars to $74 per customer. Some other considerations, uh, a neighborhood sale gives you a higher rate of penetration into the market in a particular area due to, number one, reduced upfront cost, uh, reduced footprint at the customer location. Uh, the aesthetics are much better for the 900. We've even put 900 CPEs inside of attics in people's home and shoot through the shingles on the outside of the house so there's nothing visible outside. Ability to operate in areas with homeowners restrictions that may keep you from being able to put up a tower. Faster time to market. So the summary of the cost, conventional tower, $114 per client, neighborhood sales, $74 per client. Now the CPE cost is a little bit higher for the 900 because the cards cost more. But typically we get that covered by the installation fee. So here's an example of one of our neighborhood sales. This one's been out for about a year now. We've accumulated 15 clients. All of these clients are non-line of sight. They're all shooting through oak trees. Uh, all the CPEs are mounted uh, about 12 or 15 feet off the ground on the roof of the house. And it uh, looks like we've got about 1.2 megs of traffic uh, on the tower right now. We have 15 clients associated and the lowest signal strength is a NEG 85, which is well within the specifications of that particular radio card. So in summary, non-line of sight neighborhood cells can provide you with, number one, penetration into areas where you previously could not serve customers, lower cost of entry, costs us less money up front, less money out of our pocket to deploy a cell, lower build-out costs per client, faster time to market, you can beat your competitors into an area by utilizing existing structures, the ability to mitigate interference and not have to put up with uh, the interference because we're mounting below the tree canopy, and faster return on your capital investment. So that's all I have for you today. Uh, if you'd like to contact me, there's my email address, steve at learnmicrotech.com. Uh, our website is up there as well. I appreciate the fact that you all stayed awake even after during a very good, you know, after a very good lunch today. Nobody fell asleep, so that's a good sign. And uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the month. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, maybe somebody has a question for yeah. 
Hello. Uh, what about bandwidth? Um, what is the bandwidth you deliver to your customers? And the second question, if you have uh, this scenario, 15 to 20 clients, uh, what, what would be the maximum bandwidth you could deliver to your customers? Okay. Uh, if you've used the uh, 900 megahertz card before, it is configured on the MicroTIC as a 2.4 card. That's how it's seen. Uh, and so you have basically the same restrictions uh, that you would with 802.11b or 802.11g. Uh, we run all of ours in the B mode, so the maximum throughput is somewhere around 3 megabits per second. Uh, we're selling 512k, 1 meg, and 1.5 meg connections to our clients, and we uh, allocate that bandwidth using PPPoE and radius and queues that get handed back by the radius server. So you could put more than 15 clients. That's about all we've been able to get in a neighborhood, though, uh, within about a two to three mile radius. So does uh, yeah. Hello. Uh, how much your clients pay for the installation of the internet? And uh, what kind of hardware do you use? Okay. Uh, our installation fee is $199 US. Uh, and our lowest price service is $49.95 a month. And so upon installation, the customer pays $250. That's $199 for install plus their first month of service. Uh, our equipment cost uh, for the CPE on the 900 megahertz is about $250. So we really don't make any money the first month, but after that we do, we're profitable. Uh, and you ask about what equipment we use. Uh, of course, all MicroTIC, um, the XR9 card, and the Arc Wireless integrated 12.5 dB panel antenna and a PoE. More questions, please. In the USA, you don't use uh, nine, uh, 900 megahertz for a cell phone, mobile phone. It is free for, for use. 900 megahertz, yeah? Yes. Yes, it's an unlicensed frequency in the US. Yeah, because in some countries, they use it for mobile phones also. At least they used to do it. Oh, as another source of interference? Yes. Yeah. That's true. Okay, more questions, please? Okay, so thank you very much, Steve. Thank you.